My guest today at Studio Kaiju is Stanton Friedman, who is a noted nuclear physicist and has been for the last four decades one of the premier investigators into events having to do with UFO research. Mr. Friedman uh, started out working on projects, some of which were top secret, uh, through the 50s and 60s. And uh, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about that, how you, uh, how you got started in that field. Well, uh, I got bachelor's and master's degrees in physics from the University of Chicago. My first job was as a nuclear physicist for General Electric Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Department in Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, <clears throat> that was in 1956. Our focus was on trying to design, build, test ever a nuclear-powered aircraft. It was a pretty good-sized program. In 1958, for example, we uh, employed 3,500 people, 1,100 of whom were engineers and scientists, and we were spending $100 million that year. My role dealt primarily with radiation shielding for a nuclear airplane. Uh, weight is, of course, paramount, and uh, shielding is heavy. And uh, unfortunately, you do need to the crew, uh, people who might go by. So uh, I did a lot of work with with a uh, oh, exotic, exotic materials like beryllium and lithium hydride and boron carbide and tungsten alloys and stuff like that. And uh, I directed experiments at other facilities uh, down at Fort Worth, Texas, uh, now General Dynamics. Now it's not allowed to change the game again. Lucky what I guess. <laughs> and at facilities at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and other places. And uh, I saw the handwriting on the wall and got out when getting out was good and went to another classified program, uh, Aerojet General Nucleonics, in California, working on compact nuclear power plants for space applications and fusion propulsion systems, stuff like that. Now, I, I'd gotten interested in UFO. I read, he, he read the first one. Yeah. Edward Ruppelt's book, uh, The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects. He was head of Project Blue Book in the early 50s. And that got me interested. It didn't convince me, but I uh, shared the book with a neighbor. Charlie was more interested than I was. He was 10 years older than I was and uh, an engineer. And I moved to California at uh, Aerojet and read 15 more books, some of which were junk. <laughs> Joined the old APRO and NICAP, the two major groups back then. And then discovered Project Blue Book, Blue Book Spent Port 14 at the University of California Berkeley Library, and was astonished to find that uh, here's this tremendous amount of data on 3,201 sightings, and yet uh, none of the other books that I'd read had mentioned it. And furthermore, the, the guy who put it out included the Air Force press release and 1955, in which the Secretary of the Air Force lied through his teeth. And that was a wake-up call for me. I mean, working under security, you get a little careful about what you say, and sometimes you have to sort of slide by the truth. But he flat-out lied. He said, the, on the basis of this report, we believe that no objects such as those properly described as flying saucers have overflown the United States. Even the unknown 3% could have been identified as conventional phenomena or illusions if more complete observational data had been available. Well, that sounds pretty straightforward. That's a direct quote I just gave. The only trouble is the unknowns weren't 3%. They were 21.5%. And by definition, they were not the ones for which there was insufficient information. There was a separate category, 9.5%. So that shook me up. Secretary of the Air Force got out lying. In addition, the press release didn't give the title of the report, Blue Book Special Report 14, presumably because some reporter might have asked, uh, hey, what do you mean 14? What happened to 1 through 13? They didn't say who did the work at Battelle Memorial Institute in Columbus, Ohio, a very well-respected research and development firm. And so they've been putting out a lot of lies like that since. Now, I didn't go public 
for a while. I talked to my colleagues at work. We brown bagged our lunches, and so we, sometimes we'd talk about flying saucers. But uh, then in Indianapolis, after <laughs> more canceled programs in California, I was working for General Motors on the military compact reactor program. Again, shielding was a primary concern. And I got to know Frank Edwards, who was active in NICAP, National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. He was on the board. And uh, I had him speak to a local group of which I was a member, not a UFO group. And so when he wrote his new book, Flying Saucer's Serious Business, he sent me a copy because by this time I had moved to Westinghouse Astronuclear Lab in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, after the military compact reactor program was canceled. <laughs> At Westinghouse, uh, there, there was a, an active UFO group in town, a part of NICAP, and I just, I wrote Frank, and I said, Frank, I want to go public. You got any ideas? He knew everybody. He was a nationally recognized newsman. And so he gave me some names, and one of them was the producer of a radio talk show in Pittsburgh on KDKA, one of the big early... 50,000-watt uh, clear channel station, still there. And uh, they had a program called Contact, appropriate name somehow. And I called and gave them a pitch, and they said, don't call us, we'll call you. Well, less than a month later, they called me because somebody had canceled an appearance. <laughs> they called me at 30 to do a 7 o'clock show. And I could because I was near the station. So I did the show, and somebody at work, a woman technician at work, heard me on the show, and it so happens she was head of a book review club, and the book they were looking at was Frank Edwards' book. And she asked if I would give a lecture to the group. That was my first talk in her living room. Flying saucers are real. Keep the same title, 700 lectures later now. But what was interesting to me was I did that show a number of times, did a lot of uh, freebie talks. Everybody wants a program for the organization. I learned my trade. And then one day, again, strictly by accident, I was being driven to work by Joanne. I lived downtown, Westing. She worked, she was a supervisor at Westinghouse, PhD from Carnegie Mellon. And she asked me, um, or, and we talked about UFOs. I said, gee, I'd like to talk to Carnegie Mellon. She says, why don't you talk to the dean? I said, well, I talked to Dr. So-and-so, and he wasn't interested. She said, Stan, the dean's my husband. He's heard you on the radio. Why don't you give him a call? Okay. <laughs> so I did. And he was all excited about having me speak, and we arranged a date. Uh, but it was a daytime program at 11 o'clock in the morning. I know I'd have to take the morning off work. And he asked me, how much do you want? And I said, oh, I asked for 100 I was figuring he'd knock me down to 50. So, and then because I knew his wife, and he was a decent guy, he told me what me and the other, and the other people in the series. 1,500, 1,700, numbers like that. And uh, he wrote a very nice letter after we had a very good response at the university. He wrote a letter to the agent who he booked the other people through, and he booked me at the Engineering Society of uh, 300 bucks plus expenses. And what was